It's 19 hours GMT. Hello, good evening to you. Welcome to News 360. This live money is up here at Adesawe in Kanda. My name is Alfred Okansi. I'm Natalie Fort. A look at the top stories this evening. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, GT Bank, and Piccadilly Biscuits, My Life Insurance. 35-year-old man arrested after attempting to commit suicide in Parliament. First Deputy Speaker Jose Usu questions the integrity of MPs over being marked present when indeed they are absent and even without permission. Also ahead this evening, West Africa Examinations Council denies leakage in this year's basic education certificate examinations. An inspection at fuel retail outlets reveal some oil marketing companies continue to breach regulatory requirements. And on the international front this evening, Boris Johnson secures highest number of votes in first ballot to select Conservative Party leader and next Prime Minister. Stay with us here on News 360. We've got the details of these and much more news, as always. We're live all across the world on our website. It's 3news.com. And on Facebook, it's TV3 Ghana. And also remember, we're live on DSTV channel 279. To our first story, this evening, a 35-year-old man has been arrested after attempting to commit suicide in Parliament. The man identified as Kojo Mensah was restrained by security personnel after trying to jump from the public gallery. The man from Kwesimini team in the Western region had sat through parliamentary proceedings on Thursday. But just when the speaker adjourned for the day, he got up from his seat and attempted to jump from the public gallery into the main chamber. Officers from Parliament's protection unit in the chamber quickly moved in to foil his intended action. He was transferred to the ministry's police station. Commander of the Parliament Protection Unit, Superintendent Freeman Teti said, a criminal investigation has begun into his conduct. We have a very solid security arrangement, so I don't think it will change anything at all. These are the challenges as police officers we face. The reason why we are here is to handle security within an immediate outer of parliament. So that is our responsibility, and we are doing it very well. It's a criminal case that is being taken care of by the police. So details can only be given by the Ministry of Police. And we are referring the case to the Ministry of Police Station to conduct investigation. Vice Chairman of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Defence and the Interior, Colin Sowuzwa Mankwa is of the view the incident was an attempt to bring the image of the legislature into disrepute. It's not done anywhere. And we are not supposed to come here with party colors. And the fact that the young man was wearing I mean, party colors, it tells you that it was well orchestrated just to embarrass parliament and for that matter, the state. It is unclear why he attempted suicide. We'll more on that issue there subsequently. But still in Parliament, First Deputy Speaker Joseph Osei-Usu has questioned the integrity of members of the House who are marked as having attended Parliament even when they fail to do so without permission. He said he has no reason, he has reason to strike out the names of about 15 of such MPs. Leadership of Parliament have continuously raised concerns about the poor attendance to the House despite its heavy workload. Ningo Pram Pram MP Samuel Nete George, during the correction of votes and proceedings for the previous day, expressed strong reservations about the manipulation of Parliament's register. This is an honorable house of Parliament. Can we all be truthful to ourselves that if, and to God, that if you take today's vote and proceedings, the names marked present were really present in this chamber. There are, or even at committees, there are some names 
that we can mention here, that appear present every day. Here. We've never seen them here. Even State of the Nation address, they don't even attend. Yes. It is a fact. And I'm saying yet names appear here. So is it that there is a way to get yourself marked present in the mail room, even when you are not present? Maybe as a first time member of parliament, I have not been initiated. Commenting on the development, first Deputy Speaker of Parliament Joseph Osewusu said the practice is unacceptable and advised MPs to desist from it. The complaint now is there are so many members whose name appear as present, whose ne faces never show anywhere. As I just went through, I have marked about 15 from the record of yesterday that I did not see anywhere. They don't belong to the committees which were in meeting yesterday. I know for a fact. How did their names get onto our record? That is what the Honorable Member for Kaikui Central talked about. It borders on our integrity, and I think it is important that we do not give room for people to doubt our integrity. Well, to the extent that this is not the first time this is happening, many are questioning what Parliament is doing in punishing such members of Parliament uh, and absenting themselves and going to mark themselves present. Now, the president of the University of Education branch of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, that's UTAG, has secured injunction on the university's upcoming election for a pro vice chancellor. The move, according to Dr. Frimpong Ketri Duku, is to demand due process from the school in the organization of the election. Dr. Frimpong Ketri Duku, who was once suspended by the school and later reinstated, says he's among others praying the court to compel the university to call for nomination, allowing interested parties to contest in the election. Pro vice chancellor elections are conducted every four years. Let's stay a bit on this. Dr. Keche Doko himself has joined us on the telephone. Um, Dr. Doko, if you can hear me. Now, you're challenging this, this particular election process in the court of law. You say that due process is not being followed in electing the pro vice chancellor. What, what was the process that was being employed which you're challenging? Hello? 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 I, I can hear you now. Yes, I, I can hear you now. I, I didn't get a question. I, I, I was asking, now you are in court challenging the election of the pro vice chancellor. You say that due yes. process is not being followed in electing the pro vice chancellor of University of Education, whenever. Now, what, what process was in place which you are challenging now in court? Uh, uh, I'm challenging the process of uh, electing the VC as we have started in the past. Uh, this stems from the fact that our act and statutes do not allow any individual to restrain other members from contesting for that position. Our statutes and acts make it possible for every convocation member who feels he qualifies and is interested in becoming a VC to contest. But I've realized that of late, what we've done is to give an authority or permission to one individual to restrain other members by electing only three from the convocation members to be uh, voted for. Now, but, but, but previously, what was the practice until this, uh, <laughs> for the lack of a better expression, imposition that you are referring to? That is what I've said, that we have given... In the past, we have given the authority 
or the permission to the vice chancellor to nominate three members. And what I knew was that in the past, the vice chancellors used to nominate the senior most professors to contest for that position. Right. But of late, you don't know how the selections are done. Uh, for instance, the last selection that I restrained the, the, the management from going ahead, we had two individuals who were not re-nominated this time. So the question is, why were those two individuals uh, set aside? Because they are not on retirement. They have not reached the retirement age. So why were they not so brought along to be voted for? So if we have given individuals an opportunity to do as the favor by short listing, then we're expecting that at least fairness would have applied. But now that fairness is not being applied, then the statutes and the act must be implemented as a the, the letter. Okay, Doc, I want to thank you very much for your time this evening. This matter as far in court will follow the proceedings and continuously update our viewers. Dr. Kechu Duku is the uh, UTAC branch president of the University of Education, whenever. Well, let's turn to some other stories this evening. As the Ghana Association of Persons with Albinism has presented a petition to the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, on violations of their rights in some four communities in the country. A study conducted by the association in 2018 indicated that 25% of communities in Ghana still engage in cultural practices which infringe upon the human rights of albinos. Albinism is an inherited genetic condition that reduces the amount of melanin pigment formed in the skin, hair, and or eyes. It occurs in all racial and ethnic groups throughout the world. Persons with a congenital disorder often have problems with vision and are at risk of developing skin cancer. Globally, persons with a condition continue to suffer discrimination, neglect, and stigmatization, and Ghana is no exception. The educational facilities are not there for persons with albinism to stay in classroom. Um, when, when I was in school, for example, and some of the children that are coming, which I'm crying for, we are made to sit and study with people. We are made to sit and study from the same print of notebooks, exercise book. We are made to study from them. I would like the examination council to do something about the answer sheets. The font size of the objective test was it was very small and I struggled a lot. At a ceremony to mark International Albinism Awareness Day, instituted to prevent attacks and discrimination against persons with the condition, the Director of Education for Engage Now Africa, an NGO, Francis Ansa, indicated that the organization is engaging stakeholders in education to put mechanisms in place to ensure persons with albinism allocated extra time during examinations. We are in uh, discussions with WAEC. We've laid a paper to them which they have accepted and which they'll be presenting on the day of their conference. And it will be accepted and um, people with persons with albinism across West Africa, for instance, will have the ability to have large fonts and extra time for their examinations. The Association of Persons with Albinism presented a petition to officials of the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice charge on violations on their human rights in some four communities in the country and entreated the body to investigate their grievances. The theme for this year is Still Standing Strong. President Okufuado has described Ghana as the safest country in West Africa and is therefore asking Africans in the diaspora to come, explore and experience the country in this year of return. He was addressing the House of Assembly of St. Vincent and the Grenadians as part of his tour of the Caribbean country. According to President Ikufuado, Ghana remains one of the few countries where citizens see themselves as each other's keeper, as crime and terror have become part of everyday life in recent times. Ghana, the president stressed, is full of stunning views and scenery, which locals take for granted, but visited find breathtaking. However, the most attractive and the greatest selling point of Ghana is and always has been her people, the Ghanaian people. The welcome that you find in Ghana, with all due respect to honorable members in this house, is unique and like, and like none anywhere else in the world. 
Our foods are interesting and tend to be once sampled, never forgotten. I suspect I do not need to remind you that we are home of kente, the fabric that has come to define the black race everywhere and will lead in fashion on the continent. President Ikufado told the House that the year of return is being used as a bridge to build stronger ties between Ghana, those on the continent, and the African diaspora. I invite all Africans in the diaspora to come, explore and experience Ghana in this year of return. We want to use this year of return as a bridge to build stronger ties between Ghana, those of us on the continent, and the African diaspora. To those of you who would want to come and stay, we say you're most welcome. Africa is your home, and Ghana would be happy to serve as the bridge between the diaspora and the African continent. The president, who is undertaking the five-nation tour of the Caribbean as part of efforts to promote the year of return, told the House of Assembly in St. Vincent and the Grenadines that 2019 marks the 400th anniversary of the first recorded arrival in America of West African slaves. The Homecoming and Investment Summit, the African American Investment Forum, the Pan-African and Emancipation Day celebrations, the Deba from Jamestown to Jamestown, the Film Festival and the Full Circle Festival are some of the activities that will be held to commemorate the year-long event. Well, let's turn to our MTN Veg reports this evening on News 360 as citizen journalist Peter Sheshi from Sang in the Mio district of the northern region takes his turn on our MTN Veg report. This is St. Anthony Catholic Primary School in Sang in the Mion district of the northern region. These are the rip off roof of the school. The children are just loitering about. You can see some of the debris around. When teachers come to school, they sit under the tree with the children without any effective teaching and learning taking place. That is the pavilion. It is also down where children have been buying their food. Specifically, that's the canteen of the school. This is Peter Sechi reporting from Mio district of the northern region. Well, certainly a worrying one there by Peter. We look forward to also receiving your MTN Vid reports, which you could send to us via WhatsApp number. It's 055 And remember, you're still live here on News 360. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and on DSTV Channel 279. Still, that's, there's a lot coming up tonight. Welcome back to News 360. Let's get into the business segment this evening. Starting off at the ports, as management of Meridian Ports and Services says, the 11% increase in port charges was agreed on with the Ghana Ports and Harbors four years ago. Head of legal, Ibo Brown, in an interview, ruled out any further increase in the cost of doing business at the ports. Per the contract signed in 2015, NPS is expected to take charge of Terminal 3 operations, with GPHA having 30% shares in the business. The 11% increment in port tariffs, including Marine, Steve Dawes and Shaw Handling, was a provision in the concessional agreement, which will last for 35 years. It was agreed that over a period of time, there would be a tariff increase you know, to be able to pay for the facilities. That notwithstanding, if you look at the question of increment alone in terms of tariffs, you'll be missing the question because this port is bringing in efficiency to cut out a lot of costs. We've seen publications which tend to or portend to you know, indicate that um, the cost of doing business will rise in the port. That cannot be true. The head of legal for NPS, Ibo Brown, underscored the need for further stakeholder engagement. A lot of money is locked up on the sea and in the ports because traders go, 
the uh, importing items or the exporting items, because there is no direct connectivity, these things have to wait for a month. He's gone for a loan. He's paying the bank interest, and he has to wait for months or you know weeks upon weeks before getting his cargo in, and it takes a lot of days before clearing. We are cutting out all this inefficiency by creating connectivity. He dismissed the assertion that MPS is taking over GPH's role as stated in the PNDC law 601 in 1986, which gives GPHA the power to build, operate a port and set new fees and charges. From June 28, the new terminal will be operational and business players and port users are expected to experience a new technology to reflect international best practices. And, international, and Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, Robert Ahum Kalensi, has challenged local investors to take advantage of opportunities for investment in strategic anchor industries to promote national transformational drive. He was speaking at the first Ghana-EU summit in Accra. The summit, jointly organized by Ghana and the European Union, EU, brought together over 500 bankers, financiers, local and international executives, and development partners to cooperate in championing economic growth and development in Ghana. Deputy Minister for Trade and Industry, Ahom Kalinse, taxed the private sector to take center stage to boost investment and job creation. Government are not building factories. I repeat, we are not building factories. Private sector-led initiative supported and facilitated by the government. Government is looking for some of the businesses to subsidize up to 50% of the interest rate on the businesses. We need to ensure, as in every part of the world, we create that SME base, and that is the essence of our one district, one factory, and industrial transformation agenda that feeds into the value chain and the opportunities for economic transformation. Director of Investment Services at the Ghana Investment Promotion Center, GIPC, Benjamin Ashong Latte, outlined areas of investment. Agri and agro processing, look, um, this is number one. We do have manufacturing, tourism, building and construction, oil and gas, and mining, just to name a few. And in the services sector, we're looking at education, especially the technical and vocational training bit, so that they can provide the needed manpower for industry. We are looking at healthcare and then finance. I mean, in whatever we do, we need finance to oil the wheels of commerce. Other areas marked for investment to break the economic reliance on cocoa are tree crop cultivation like cotton, rubber, and oil palm. And some other business news this evening. The Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNIT, issued over 19,000 criminal summons to defaulting companies across the country last year for non-payment of employee contributions. The Director General of the Trust, Dr. John Yao Tenkran, who made this known, said only 60,000 of the 250,000 registered companies in the country pay their workers' contributions. The Director General of SNIT said even though compliance levels have improved, companies still fail to deliver even after several engagements. The court basically rules and it says that we are given a certain time to make the payment and then you have to comply and if you don't comply, it's deemed a criminal offence. However, records from the Registrar General's office has about 250,000 companies operating in the country living a deficit of 190,000 to get hooked onto the scheme. We are currently sharing data with the Registrar General so that we, we, we get to identify these companies as they are getting registered. Also, now with the Ghana Post GPS, we get to know where they are. Uh, digital addresses are so we can locate them. If the employer is not paying the SNIT on their behalf, they are being cheated. The Trust has begun an awareness campaign to get employees to know the labor laws and rights to contribute. The first engagement was with the Greater Accra Regional Branch of Organized Labor. Participants were updated on how pensions are calculated. As for we, the employer, that's the only thing we are doing, and we depend. On our retirement, so that one day when you retire, this SNIT patients can help you. 
but our employers are creating a lot of problems for us. For me, the interest basically should be on what you're going to get when that calculation is done. What we're being taken through, hopefully we'd all be able to understand as workers. Even those at the grassroots would be explained to so that in their ordinary ABC or 123, they're able to calculate their pensions. Officials of the National Pensions Regulatory Authority also reacted to concerns of slow pace of migrating workers to the three schemes. Cap 30 is a colonial legacy something that we inherited from our colonial masters. But going forward, our observation is that it, has, it is just not sustainable. Uh, and so something certainly has to be done, you know, to make it work. For that reason, under the pensions reform, it was strongly recommended that it should be phased out. So it's ongoing. I very much admit that we have not been able to meet the deadlines as stipulated in the law. SNIT is focusing on sustaining the trust to enable pensioners' benefits grow. And that's how we wrap up the business segment on News 360 this evening. You can get a lot more on these stories and some more business news on our website. It's 3news.com. Alfred, over to you. All right, and thank you, Natalie, with business. Now, Bond Savings and Loans Company has handed over a new infirmary and donated items valued at 7,000 CDs to the Christ Faith Foster Home at Frafaha here in Accra. The donation was in response to an appeal made by the orphanage. The Christ Faith Foster Home was established in 1972 and currently accommodates 41 children aged between 0 and 22. The children are mostly abandoned by disabled and mentally ill parents. Anzim Wusa Manga of the Corporate Affairs Unit of Bond Savings and Loans said the gesture formed part of the company's social responsibility. We don't just come here and donate things. Our interest is always to make sure that whatever we're bringing serves a particular need. And uh, somewhere last year, one of the needs that we, we were concerned with was um, the nature of their infirmary. And we made an agreement and decided to um, refurbish it for them. So um, that's why we're here. We always make sure that their needs come first. Director of Christ Faith Foster Home, Kofi Asubwahede, said the donation was timely. We're very grateful to them because uh, healthcare is a very important part of every facility's, uh, you know, growth. And so, uh, for them to have taken care of this is something that we can't forget. So we're very grateful to them. Bond savings and loans, which provide financial services including inward remittances, cash management, check clearing, current and savings account, has added the bond easy insure to its products. Let's turn to education-related issues as the West Africa Examinations Council, WIEC, has denied any leakage in this year's basic education certificate examinations. Director of Public Affairs, Agnes Tehkujo, who was reacting to information circulating on social media, said people should rather be on the alert and prevent scammers from selling fake question papers. Director of Public Affairs at WIEC, Agnes Tekujo confirmed having seen the alleged leak questions circulating on social media. There are some that um, our investigations have revealed that some people are, are selling these questions, which are fake, by the way, for about 200, 300, 400 Ghana cities just before the uh, mathematics paper was taken. I received about three or four versions of questions which are circulating on social media. But if you see anything circulating on social media, that does not mean that that is the question. That is going to be written. Because I had also seen some, when I got to the center, I looked at what the candidates were writing and I realized that that was not it. On similarities in some of the questions, she said Wayek will have to take some steps. Over the years, they are you can, when you look through our past questions, and sometimes you are able, if, if the person, you have a good teacher or somebody, somebody is able to come out with certain uh, maybe topics or things that would be written. So if you come across something similar, like you said, then that does not mean that the paper has leaked. I think that uh, we may need to look at our, the way that our, those who set the questions um, go about it. So I think that um, if we need to engage our setters, our moderators, our subject officers, we'll do that.
she clarified what constitutes a leaked examination paper. You can only say that a paper has leaked when you go to the exam room and you look at the paper and you realize that this was the exact paper that the candidates had taken earlier. She also addressed what could cause the cancellation of a paper. When we look at the situation and it demands it, I think first of all you look at how widespread it is. And then the council will take a decision. She said work hasn't prevented the media from covering the exams, but rather the media should first seek permission from the supervisors at the exam centers before filming. On the reports that some students from schools in Togo had registered with schools in the Keto South District and were taking part in the exams, she indicated Waek is yet to receive a report on the issue. We haven't had any official reports being made to us. Well, this is a story we've been really following keenly in our subsequent bulletin. We're going to be hearing from the Deputy Education Minister. My name is Alfred Okansi. On behalf of the rest of the team, we say thank you. And I am Black and Proud. And I'm Natalie Force. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Black and Proud. Have a pleasant evening.